Dr. Saksana Barshinova. I am an art historian, curator and researcher. In two lectures, I will try to briefly tell you about the main centers and leading figures of Ukrainian contemporary art. Ukrainian contemporary art emerged on the artistic map in the second half of the 1980s, when it became possible to speak out loud and push out various forms of official and semi-official art in the late Soviet era. This was not at the very least due to the fact that in each of the major Ukrainian cities like Kyiv, Odessa, Lviv and Kharkiv, peculiar centers of underground art had developed in the 1960s and 1970s. The development of these cultural centers back in the 19th century defined a recognizable phenomenon of Ukrainian artistic life in the 20th century – polycentrism. It was caused by the experience of living in different state formations before the First and Second World Wars, artistic influences and schools, which formed a very special phase for each city. The 1950s and 1960s considered to be a turning point in the history of global contemporary art require commentary when it comes to Ukrainian context, given the specific conditions of its development in Soviet Union. Early beginnings of contemporary art emerged in the underground, as this time already they were often isolated and the revival of the modernist tradition was dominant. This is typical for all artistic centers in Ukraine. Representatives of contemporary art in Kyiv, Lviv, Odessa and Kharkiv simultaneously develop and undermine their own artistic traditions. In the Western world, conceptualism and later hyperrealism were a reaction to the consumer society with its attractive and aggressive visuals. In the Soviet context, these movements, which emerged not much later than their global counterparts, were a reflection on the overproduction of ideology, including slogans, newspaper editorials, and an overabundance of visual propaganda on the streets. The conditions for self-realization were also different. Conceptualism emerged as a part of the unofficial culture, and artists were interested not in the problem of scientific definition of a certain subject or art itself, but in the variety of social, ideological, mythological and other interpretations of a given piece of artwork. In Ukraine, conceptualist practices revealed the specifics of the local conditions, playfulness, humor, ignoring hierarchies, strategies of illusion and absurdism. In Kiev, the latest trends emerged among the monumentalists. Their return to the analysis of the form can be considered a kind of restoration of the broken thread of modernism. Although the samples of the national avant-garde were inaccessible and were strictly prohibited and hidden from use in museum's special fund. In the 1960s, the restrictions began to partially get lifted, so the recollection of their own tradition, in particular the monumental school of Boychuk, took place in parallel with the search for new formal solutions. Reflections on the fate of art, tradition, the place of a human being, and the role of the artist led to the emergence of original artistic concepts. Thus, since 1969, Valery Lamak has been developing his grand theory of interrelationships in the art of all countries and times in his book, Book of Schemes. And in the 1970s, Fedor Tetyanich problematized coexistence of human and the environment in various forms within the context of scientific and technological progress and growing environmental problems. Fedor Tetyanich's contribution to the development of conceptualist practices can be described as those which were expanding the boundaries of and concepts about art as well as interest in actionist forms. Tetyanich called his creative philosophy and life position Fripulia, 
that is boundless freedom that permeates the cosmos and gives impetus to the existence of all things. Gradually, his philosophy became synonymous with his name. Intuitively, the Tanish came up with the method of framing reality used by Western conceptualists. For example, in 1974, he suggested that the production process in one of the workshops of the art glass factory should be treated as a theater and that he should announce it on the radio and set up chairs for the audience. At the same time, he created his biotechnosphere, constructions for human life in the universe that were realized through numerous drawings, collages, objects, texts, and installations. He later produced performances developing the idea of total art. Another distinctive phenomenon that developed in Kiev in the second half of the 1970s and early 1980s was the art of hyperrealism. Hyperrealism, in its Ukrainian version, incorporated not only the techniques of working with photography, typical of the global experience, but also a strong influence of surrealism. One can say that it joined the debate concerning the fate of figurative art in the Soviet context, where the concept of realism pertained to the entire history of world art except for abstractionism. The tendencies of hyperrealism can be seen in the early works of Tiberi Silvashi, Sergei Yakutovich, and a number of other Kiev artists. But it was developed developed most consistently by Sergei Heta, Sergei Bazilev, and Sergei Shrestuk. Kiev hyperrealists mostly depicted scenes from their everyday life, meetings in the studio, long feasts, heated conversations, celebrations, emphasizing their randomness, their present, which was most suitable to demonstrate with the imitation of photography. Kiev hyperrealism was characterized by the picture-like vision, the emotional experience of a particular moment was key. Critics noted that their paintings looked like performances reproduced in painting, as if a work had to be made with paint on canvas in order to be considered art. This painting-centric feature of the Kyiv context largely explains the surge of the Ukrainian new wave in the second half of the 1980s, especially since its leader Arsen Savadov studied from Sergei Bayalev at the Kyiv Art Institute. Post-war Kharkiv was a typical Soviet city dominated by official art. The former capital of the Ukrainian SSR in the 1920s, a center of constructivism and innovation in literature and theater, it suffered greatly from the destruction of the culture elite in the 1930s and its transformation into a province. At the same time, Vasil Yermilov, a prominent representative of the Ukrainian avant-garde, a constructivist who created a high standard of industrial design in the 1920s and 1930s, lived in Kharkiv. In his attic, which served as his home and studio simultaneously, he used to meet with young artists. Influenced largely by Yermilov, Vagrich Bakhchanyan developed his oeuvre as the artist of the word that is on the interconnection of words and imagery. They act as elements of an ideological code, the destruction of which happens through surprise, paradox and humor. Bakhchanyan's early works, collages and drawings are free in their subjects and compositions, marked by the experiments with the transfer of an image from a polygraphic print to paper. Then there were abstractions, which at that time in Soviet art were perhaps the most radical manifestation of artistic freedom. At the same time, he launched his first campaigns, in particular at the Portion plant, where he worked as a graphic designer. One of them was inspired by the work of Jackson Pollock, discovered through magazines. Under Bakhchinan's supervision, factory workers poured paint from broken buckets on the floor of an empty room, forming an abstract panel. He was soon fired from his job for propagandizing bourgeois art. Bakhchinan was one of the organizers of the first unauthorized exhibition of unofficial art in the USSR. In 1965, a one-day event called Under the Arches took place in a courtyard on Harkis Main Street, where an exhibition of works and poetry readings was organized. 
After this exhibition, he was forced to leave his hometown due to pressure from KGB, moved to Moscow first, and later emigrated to the United States, where he participated in the international Fluxus movement. However, the basic principles of his work had been formed in Kharkiv, and later he only deepened and expanded his ideas. At the same time, photography was rapidly developing in Kharkiv. In 1971, the Vremya group was formed, whose members would develop the conceptualist approach, which was interrupted by Bakhchenyan's departure from the city. The most coherent community of unofficial artists emerged in Odessa, who turned to the local tradition of early 20th century modernism, European classics and contemporary international trends. Oleg Sokolov could be considered the movement's forerunner, who began to combine approaches of surrealism, abstractionism and op art in the 1950s. Sokolov studied with Stelfil Freiman, a prominent representative of the Paris School, a friend of Marc Chagall and Henri Matisse. While working as a researcher at the Odessa Museum of Western and Eastern Art, Sokolov simultaneously explored connections between color, composition, music and word. Sokolov's work is characterized by the use of words as an independent visual image. His text images allow us to talk about the emergence of conceptualist tendencies in Odessa in the 1950s and 1960s. In 1967, in Odessa, artists Stanislav Suchov and Valentin Hrush held the legendary fans exhibition Sitcha Khrushchev, which, along with the 1965 Kharkiv campaign, is considered one of the first public exhibitions of the underground in the USSR. Valentin Hrush constantly worked with various non-figurative materials – wrapping paper, scraps of canvas, boards, household items, wood form which he carved his herrings, and so on. The principle of freedom and spontaneous creativity inherent in the artist made Hrush an ethical authority for the generation of conceptualists. The phenomenon called Odessa conceptualism was born in the Odessa underground in the late 1970s. Although the conceptualists were not a homogeneous group with a certain structure and ideology, but rather a group of friends, we can still list the main representatives – Leonid Wojtsehov, Sergei Anufriev, Yuri Leidman, Igor Shatskin, the Peppers, Ludmila Skripkina and Oleg Petrenko, the Martinchiki, Volodymyr Fedorov and others. They viewed artistic activity primarily as a creative process, as a way of self-realization in the context of the standardized Soviet system, which was opposed to play figurative provocation and artistic optionality, which broke the existing boundaries of art, authorial texts and gestures. As Sergei Anufriev recalled, their creative community grew out of a common thirst for knowledge, about contemporary art and culture, out of the need to talk about art gradually given the commentary artistic self-sufficiency. Their creative interests unfolded here through the interconnection of texts, actions, objects, drawings, conversations and discussions in which peculiarity of the local cultural context was analyzed through play and provocation. To a certain extent, their creative position was close to Fluxus, which removed the boundaries between different types of art on the program level, rejected the limitations of artwork, and considered art primarily as a way of life. As a result of the destruction of the established life in Lviv by the Soviet authorities in the post-war period, a large number of artists immigrated. Against the backdrop of this planned devastation, artists who developed modernist trends excluding expressionism, surrealism and abstractionism, characteristic of pre-war Lviv, continued to work. Yaroslava Muzika, Roman and Margaret Selsky, Roman Turin, and Leopold Levitsky became the inspiration for young people, mostly students of the newly established Institute of Decorative and Applied Arts.
The influence of the modernist tradition they managed to preserve was extremely powerful. For example, the new wave representative Andriy Shaidakovsky started from Zelsky. Conceptualist tendencies in Lviv emerged outside the modernist circle. One of these centers was the apartment of Alexander Aksinin, a graduate of the Printing Institute. By the mid-1970s, this apartment became a center of often formal communication between artists such as Halina Zhigulska, Henrietta Levitska, Nadia Ponomarenko, Volodymyr Onosaitis, and others. Aksinin's pursuit found its roots in texts and conversations with like-minded individuals hailing from Lithuania, Estonia, Poland, and Russia. Throughout his short life and until his death in 1980, in 1985, Aksinin worked primarily in the technique of etching, creating multi-layered coded book plates and compositions. Aksinin was guided by self-published translations of Western philosophy and Eastern spiritual practices, forming his own language. European absurdism can be considered a kind of foundation for Aksinin's worldview. He treats Kafka's work as a religion, Kafkaism, and analyzes Camus's work in the temporal structures of past and future. Later, complex metaphysical structures appear in his works – spheres, bionic forms, puzzles, and labyrinths. The artist organizes and visualizes all philosophical systems, and so most of his book plates are also models of certain worldview concepts. His series of graphic and colored metaphysical compositions are marked with the themes of masquerade and absurdity, which is the artist's reaction to the Soviet reality. Since 1980, with a touch of self-irony and critical approach, he has been building an imaginary microcosm with multi-layered semantic structures in the form mandalas, which are essentially modular special abstractions. Another prominent figure of the Lviv underground is Yuri Sokolov, who was a pioneer of conceptual artistic practices in Ukraine, initiator of collective projects and, in the 1990s, the founder of experimental art spaces. During the 1970s and 1980s, he taught at the Lviv Institute of Decorative and Applied Arts and became an informal teacher and interlocutor for several generations of artists. According to art historians, it was Sokolov who initiated environmentalism in Ukraine when he curated the exhibition Theatre of Things or the Ecology of Objects in 1988. Sokolov paid little attention to documenting his ideas, so his work until the mid-1980s is known to us through the artist's own histories and drafts. In the second half of the 1980s, the underground began to be recognized. Most of the representatives of the underground period of Ukrainian contemporary art joined the new generation of artists who came to the scene in the post-perestroika period.